All right, First Peter chapter number three tonight. Uh, we are looking at uh, this study in the book of First Peter, and we began last week in the opening verses of First Peter three. Um, where God is talking about marriage, the relationship between husband and wife. Now, marriage is the most sacred institution in the world. When a husband and wife are are demonstrating proper love for one another and respect for each other, I mean, that, that relationship is as close as you can get to heaven on earth. And because it is such a, a vivid picture of the relationship between Christ and the church, It is the special target of Satan's attacks. And we are seeing this on a large scale in our society as marriage in the home has been under constant attack for many, many years, generations now. We're seeing it with a redefining of the definition of marriage to include uh, things that God calls an abomination. But we also see it on the personal level as marriages are routinely destroyed by the sin of one or both spouses. And in Peter's letter to believers, he includes instructions how to live a life of good works, even in the midst of suffering. Beginning in the middle of chapter 2, he discusses how that we, through our good works, uh, can glorify God with a reputation of righteous living. We looked at what that meant in in regards to our citizenship and our employment. And then last week, we began looking at the marriage relationship. And the first six verses of this chapter give instruction to the wives about their role in a God-honoring marriage. And in verse number seven, we read the instructions to husbands about their role in that kind of a marriage. Let's look at this verse together. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, one of the first questions that I think of when I look at this is, why is there only one verse for men when women got six? I think it's maybe because men have shorter attention spans. Right, ladies? Y'all are afraid to say amen to that. All right, okay. It's all right. We can admit it. We, we, we understand. But the truth is that though the number of words may be small, the expectations that are placed upon husbands are huge. And this is one of those verses that the more you zoom in on it, the more you realize just how much is involved in it. It's so much, in fact, that while, ladies, we only took one uh, lesson to cover all six of your verses, husbands, we're going to take two lessons to cover our one verse. So tonight, we're only going to look at the first part of this verse, actually. But let me give you the summary of what we're going to see over these next couple weeks as we look at the expectations and the role of a husband A husband is expected to always be studying his wife, to know her better and better. He should appreciate that they are equal in Christ, treat her with tremendous respect, understanding that she's the weaker vessel. And he has to realize that his fellowship with God can be helped or hindered by his relationship with his wife. But by fulfilling his God-given responsibilities, a husband can direct the marriage to honor God. Now, I know that uh, statistically, uh, husbands do not make up a majority of the, of the uh, congregation tonight, but we do have a number of husbands. We have a number of young men that hope maybe one day, if they can find a woman that is willing to be a husband. Um, and, but all of us in here, uh, regardless of your status, um, you know men and women who are husbands and wives And so being armed with God's truth about marriage can be helpful even to you as maybe the Lord would use you to be a help to others. So tonight we're going to look at this verse and we're going to, like I said, we're splitting it up into two parts. And in this first lesson, we're going to answer this question, what does it mean to dwell with your wife according to knowledge, husbands? Look again at verse 7. It says, likewise ye husbands dwell with them, that is your wives, according to to knowledge. What does that mean? Well, there is a first and very obvious meaning of this. When it says dwell with them according to knowledge, it means that husbands and wives are supposed to live together. 
That is an obvious application of this. But more than that, this verse is instructing men on how to live with their wives. Husbands should live with their wives in an intelligent, knowledgeable way. Dwell with them according to knowledge. A husband must learn to understand his wife and get to know her better and better. Now, as we begin to examine this, as we kind of zoom in on this idea, um, I want us to notice, first of all, the pitfalls to understanding. The pitfalls to understanding. It, you know, it, it is easy when we're talking about husbands and wives to just kind of make light of it and joke about the differences and all those sorts of things. And I'm not going to lie, I might make a crack a joke here or there, but, you know, this is a very serious matter. And when it comes to men and women understanding each other, it's no secret that men and women have a hard time with that. Why is that? You know, after all, we are the same species, right? I mean, you wouldn't think so. so there, that, see, I just did it again. I just went to crack a joke. We are the same species. We speak the same language, right? And usually a husband and wife speak, you know, the same English, Spanish, whatever it is. So why is it that we have such a difficult time understanding one another, men and women in general, but husbands and wives specifically? Well, there are two that I think um, are worthy of our time tonight. First of all, the first reason it's a challenge is because God has designed us so differently. Because God's designed us so differently, there are infinite opportunities for us to learn about each other. When God saw Adam... He said it's not good for him to be alone. He made Eve, and she. And the Bible says that he wanted to make Adam a, a help meet, that is a suitable helper for him, somebody who could assist him, somebody could fill in the gaps, if you will. And God intentionally made Eve different from Adam, not just physically, but really in every way there were differences that were designed by God to complement Adam. So God designed women different than men. And to be honest, to men, women are baffling creatures. It is hard for men to understand women. And just when a woman or a man thinks he has a woman figured out, she'll do something that so unexpected it puts him back in preschool. And the process of a husband getting to know his wife is ongoing. It should never stop. Because, and this is true, I'm not being sarcastic when I say this, that she is a beautifully complex creation of God whose wonders will never cease to amaze him. Now, before sin, this wasn't a problem, this differences between husband and wife. They could communicate together perfectly. There were no secrets between them. They were free to be open and to share their, sh- their hearts without fear of being misunderstood or being judged harshly. Adam and Eve were not omniscient. They still had to learn about each other, but they had the perfect ability to understand and they had unlimited time to learn before the fall. But then they chose to sin and, and everything changed. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they became guilty and ashamed. What was one of the first things, the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they sinned? They covered themselves. The Bible says that they sewed fig leaves to make themselves aprons of fig leaves to cover themselves. Their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked, so they made a covering of fig leaves. That is no coincidence because their, their natural state as God created them in that state of perfection, there was nothing to be ashamed of. But when they sinned, their eyes were open, they knew that they were naked, and that nakedness was indicative of the openness and the understanding that they had before. It wasn't a problem then because they had nothing to be ashamed of. But once Adam and Eve sinned, they had something to hide. And so they covered themselves. Think of it this way. They limited 
the information that was available to each other. Because who were they trying to hide themselves from? Think it through with me. It wasn't from their it wasn't from themselves. They didn't have a mirror. They were hiding themselves from each other first and later from God. Hebrews 4.13 talks about this openness and this understanding when it speaks of how God knows us perfectly. It says, Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So the first reason why we have difficulty understanding one another is because of design. But the second reason is because of the destruction of sin. Sin ruined everything. And in the very act of covering themselves, it was demonstrated that sin had ruined the perfect understanding that the husband and wife could have of each other. And now there was a temptation to hide things. See, now because of sin... All of us are hesitant to open up, to be honest, to be vulnerable because we know that we have a lot to be ashamed of. We know that. We know our faults. We know our failures. And we're not proud of them. And so what do we do? We hide them. We hide them because we fear judgment. We fear reprisal. We close ourselves off from others even from our spouses, sometimes especially from our spouses. We retreat into our shells and we let very few people see the real us. That is a result of sin. We only open up to people that we feel like we can really trust and sometimes we feel like we cannot trust anyone at all. Now it is true that women generally feel this vulnerability of exposure more than men do. Men on the whole have less shame than women. And again, I'm not being sarcastic there. That's just the truth. Women are much more sensitive to that. That's one of the faults that men have that we have to overcome as Christian men. But it's also true that a woman needs to be able to open up more than a man does. They have a greater need for to be able to express themselves emotionally and in every context. And so men, on the other hand, are less emotional creatures and, and therefore don't need to be known and understood to the degree that most women do. So what you have here are, are two competing facts that make it very difficult in the context of a relationship to come to an understanding between husband and wife. So you have the fact that the wife is more likely to hide because of shame while she also needs to be open with someone more than the husband. And that creates a huge challenge in the context of marriage. All because of sin. So when when Peter says, dwell with your wife according to knowledge, that is a tall order. Now, men, you need to understand that, that this is something that you are not going to achieve without some intentional effort on your part. And women, you need to understand and appreciate it too, that in order for a husband to obey this command, he's going to have to work hard for it. That doesn't mean you make him work harder than he has to, but it means that you understand that his God-given responsibility is to is to dwell with you according to knowledge. So we have these pitfalls to understanding that we need to acknowledge. But let's discuss, more importantly, the path to understanding. The path to understanding. Being that we are designed so differently, and being that that design's been corrupted by sin, and it's made it even more challenging to understand one another, how are we... Uh, as Christian husbands and wives, how are we to come to a better understanding of one another? How can a husband obey this command? Marriage is intended by God to restore the openness, honesty, and vulnerability that husband and wife once re- enjoyed before sin. That's, what, that's, that's where marriage is supposed to go. 
It's not going to go there overnight. It's going to take a lifetime to work towards that goal. But that's that was part of God's design. That was in his original design, that there would be openness and honesty and vulnerability in the right way between husband and wife. And Christian marriage should seek to restore that. Now, one of the clearest proofs of this tr- truth is the fact that God limits the act of physical intimacy for the husband and wife alone. Because you should not be that open and vulnerable to anyone but your spouse. Genesis chapter 2, when God created Eve and brought her to Adam, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Matthew 19, Jesus reiterated God's design for marriage when he said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That is God's intention for marriage. It's seen clearly in the physical aspect. Hebrews 13 verse 4, marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So there's to be a oneness there, an openness and an honesty and an understanding reserved for only the relationship between a husband and wife. The physical intimacy between husband and wife is unique in this special regard. Physically speaking, it's through it that the highest degree of knowledge and familiarity is gained. That's why in the Bible, it's called, that act of intimacy is called knowing. Genesis 4.1, Adam Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. That's what marriage is supposed to do. It's supposed to be restoring that knowledge. A husband's knowledge of his wife includes the physical aspect, but it's certainly not limited to that. A husband should seek to know his wife in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So how are we to accomplish that? What is the path here? I'm going to give you three steps tonight on the path to understanding in a Christian marriage. Step number one is the step of redemption. A husband should learn how his wife thinks, how she feels, what her likes are, what her dislikes are, how she views the world, what are her hopes and fears. But to do this, the husband must create an atmosphere in the marriage where the wife can feel comfortable opening up to her husband and letting him know her for who she really is. And the first step in doing that is in creating that atmosphere is spiritual redemption. What I mean by that is that the gospel must be applied to the marriage relationship for it to work as God designed. It must be. There's no way for two people who are not saved to come to the greatest level of understanding between them. They can't without God. Remember, sin ruined everything, including that ability for husband and wife to understand each other. They became guilty and ashamed, and they hid themselves. They limited the information communicated to their spouse. And as long as that guilt and that shame remains, there will be barriers between husband and wife. They will never achieve oneness. Now, the world will offer all kinds of solutions, quote-unquote, to these marital problems, but they're nothing more than the fig leaves that Adam and Eve sowed for themselves. All of the self-improvement in the world will never be enough to make up for the guilt and the shame that we have, and we will be left with the urge to hide from God and from others. Only the gospel can perfectly cover our guilt and our shame. Only the gospel can do it. That was demonstrated in the garden, by the way. 
when God made coats of skin to replace Adam and Eve's fig leaves. Genesis 3, 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. In order for that to happen, an animal had to be killed. God had to, the, God had to kill an animal in the place of Adam and Eve to take the skin of that animal to make a covering for Adam and Eve's guilt and shame. That was a picture of what Christ would later do for us on the cross. He died on the cross in our place. He shed his blood for us to atone for our sins. That word atone literally means a covering. The blood of Christ is what covers our guilt and our shame. It removes it from us as well so that we can stand before God in humble confidence that we are accepted by Him through Christ Jesus. That's what the gospel does. It makes us acceptable to God so that we do not have to be ashamed when we stand before Him. He was buried and He rose again so that we might have eternal life in His name so that we could be saved from our sins. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when both husband and wife have accepted the sacrifice of Christ for their sins and know that they can stand before God unashamed, they can then stand before each other unashamed. You see how important the gospel is to marriage? If you're not able to stand before God unashamed, you won't be able to stand before anyone else. But at the, other, at the same time, if you can stand before God unashamed because of the blood of Jesus Christ, then you can stand before anyone else. Yes, you have faults. Yes, you're not perfect. But when husband and wife both have confessed that they are sinners and trusted Christ, that's not a problem anymore. It's no longer a close-held secret that you're a fallen sinner. They know. They know that the other, each is a sinner. And now, because they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, they can love each other with unconditional love in spite of their faults because that's how God loves us. They can show grace to one another. They can be patient to one another. They can assume the best of each other because all of these traits in, of love and more are all demonstrated in the gospel that we have been redeemed by. The first step in the path of understanding is redemption. It's possible to have a redeemed marriage when both husband and wife have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. In the context of 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter was writing about, first of all, a wife whose husband did not believe and how she can act in that situation to influence him. But now in verse 7, He's making it very clear that it is the men who have the responsibility to take the lead. And when it comes to salvation, men, let me tell you, you better be sure of your salvation. If there is any doubt in your mind whatsoever, if there's any question about whether or not you are saved, you need to get that settled. Because until you are able to stand before God unashamed, you'll never be able to stand before your wife unashamed. So there's the step of redemption. Then secondly, the second step on the path to understanding is the step of acceptance. The step of acceptance. See, redemption is the first and most important step on the path. But you know what? You're still going to have two sinful creatures trying to exist in harmony with a limited ability to understand. And herein lies the problem. There are other steps that must be taken by the husband to move toward a better understanding of his wife. So if a husband is to dwell with his wife according to knowledge, he must carefully communicate to his wife in a way that she understands that he accepts her for who she is and she is safe opening up to him. It is the husband's responsibility to set this tone in the marriage. He has to make sure that he is taking the lead in communicating this, in creating this atmosphere, setting the tone, if you will. The wife will always be tempted to hide herself, especially when she is made to feel that she has something to be ashamed of. 
She's always going to have that temptation, man. You need to just factor that in. Sometimes that can happen. That that is, she can feel like she has something to be ashamed of. Sometimes that can happen because of sin in her own life. Because with sin, again, comes guilt and shame. And a woman who has sin in her life and is questioning her standing before God because of the sin and the temptation to be guilty and shame that comes with it, then she's not going to have the ability to open up to her husband properly either. Only confession can cleanse that sin and restore to a right fellowship with God. A wife who harbors guilt and shame is not only hurting herself, she's hurting her marriage too. The wife can also be made to feel that she has something to be ashamed of by mistreatment from the man whom she is supposed to be able to trust. When he shames her, she hides herself. He must let her know, the husband must let his wife know that he accepts her even though she's imperfect. Man, I hope you don't expect your wife to be perfect. Because it's not going to happen. You need to let her know that you love her even though she may at times not exactly act totally lovable. And even though many times she may not feel lovable, you need to let her know that you love her. That's not as easy as it may sound because she is a fallen sinner who's tempted to think things that are not true. She may have experienced things in her life that make trusting her husband even more difficult, but it's the husband's duty to seek to know his wife better and better. And that begins by uh, not first with redemption and then by setting an atmosphere of acceptance. Many husbands have made their job harder than necessary, if not impossible, by being critical and judgmental of their wives. They've been ungracious with their wife's shortcomings and been hypocritical in judging her faults while denying or overlooking or downplaying his own. And so they've created a culture of shame and guilt, and it's no wonder that the wife has hidden herself by whatever fig leaves she can get her hands on. Instead, the husband must say and show that he accepts his wife for who she is, giving her permission to open up and be vulnerable to him. So there's the step of redemption. Secondly, the step of acceptance. And then thirdly, we'll simply call it the step of learning. The step of learning. As the husband establishes this culture of openness and acceptance in a redeemed marriage, he should actively seek to get to know his wife better. And most men are secretly experts at how to do this. And if they would, they would realize it if they just took a moment to think about it. If you are married here tonight, men in particular, I want you to think back with me before you married your wife. When you first met your wife, do you remember that time you met her the very first time? I remember when I met Lane the very first time. Walked into Sunday school one Sunday morning. I was in 11th grade and here was this uh, young lady visiting our teen group from I didn't know where. And so you know what I did? I went up and introduced myself to her. And I said, you know, good to have you here. My name's Stephen. What's your name? And she said, my name's Lane. And where are you from? Found out where she was visiting from. There were some girls in our youth group near where she had lived in Maryland. So I went and sat down and said, hey, you should go talk to her. She's from where you used to live. And they went and talked to her, and the rest is history. But you know, that first day that I met her, I didn't know anything about her at all, except she was pretty. I knew that right away. But you know what? Over time, I got to know her a lot better. Men, how did you get to know your wife when you began to be interested in her? What did you begin to do? You began to learn more about her. How'd you do that? By spending time with her. By talking to her. By listening to her. By paying attention to her. By asking questions so that you could learn more and more about her. Maybe you called it dating. Maybe it was going steady. Maybe it was courting. Whatever you called it, 
The purpose of it was spending intentional time with that woman who would become your wife because you wanted to get to know her. And this is my point. You know how to dwell with your wife according to knowledge. The problem is the knowledge part often stops when the dwelling part starts. That's too often what happens. A couple gets married and all of a sudden everything changes. And whereas before there was all kinds of interest that the husband showed in the wife and everything and wanted to know her, now all of a sudden it's like, all right, I got my wife. I can go on with my life now. Now they may not think that way, but sometimes they act that way. Husband, you need to keep studying your wife. You should study her more closely and diligently than even the most dedicated scientific researcher. Sometimes that may be what you feel like as you're studying your wife. You may wish that you could pull out a microscope and look inside her mind and see exactly what's going on in there. And you wish that you had, uh, you know, millions of dollars worth of research equipment at your disposal to try and figure out what exactly is making her tick. But that is the level of diligence that you should show. Never stop learning about your wife. And let me tell you this. For you young guys out there especially, this is going to be real encouraging to you. The longer you are married, the harder you need to work to get to know your wife. You know, that's exactly backwards of common common thinking, traditional wisdom. It's like, well, we've been married forever. We know each other. No, all you figured out is just how much you don't know about each other. What happens many times in a marriage is that over time, interest is lost. You know, the, the, fl- the flame burns low. The passion fades. However you want to say it. What was once fascinating is now ordinary. There's something called the law of diminishing returns. When you're talking about any different thing, to go from one level to the next level requires twice as much work as the previous level. And that same is true in marriage. To reach the next level of knowledge, you're going to have to work harder than you ever did to reach the previous levels put together. And you need to understand, man, that's your duty. That's your responsibility. And thankfully, if you will do it, it's worth it. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 9 says, Live joyfully with the wife of whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is the portion, thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Live joyfully with her. Have fun figuring her out. But some men are, are unwilling to put forth that effort, and the marriage stagnates. Now let me warn let me warn you tonight that that stagnation in marriage can lead to some terrible things, even infidelity. In a worst case, a husband begins to invest his energy in getting to know another woman. She may be no better than his wife, probably not near as good, but she's different, and that interests him. He begins to get curious. He starts asking the other woman questions, listening to her talk and learning more about her, and in so doing, he's already gone down the path of emotional infidelity. And if not stopped, it will likely lead to physical adultery. And let me just say this, the same kind of thing can happen with pornography. Men, don't go there. That is a level of knowledge that is to be reserved for your wife only. Infidelity will destroy the atmosphere of acceptance and safety in the marriage. So dwell with your wife and only your wife according to knowledge. So you see tonight when Peter says, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, that's a tall order. But men, it's our duty and it's our privilege. As I was finishing up my notes for this message, I, I was uh, reminded of a song from a musical called The King and I. How many of you have ever been subjected to that? I mean, you had the privilege of watching that. All right. In that musical, there's a character named Anna who's a British school teacher. She travels to Siam to be the governess 
to the king's many children. And she sings a song to the children entitled, Getting to Know You. It's meant to be a cute, heartwarming song about a teacher and her students becoming familiar and comfortable with each other. And in the song, the character says, getting to know you, getting to feel free and easy when I'm with you. Getting to know what to say. Haven't you noticed suddenly I'm bright and breezy because of all the beautiful and new things I'm learning about you day by day. You know, men are not especially known for that warm desire to want to know others personally. We can be cold and indifferent, even though we may not mean to be. It's part of the differences in how God has designed us. But if a marriage is to honor God, then the husband must learn to understand his wife and get to know her better and better. Heavenly Father, As we close this portion of our Bible study out tonight, I want to pray especially for all of the married couples in our church who I believe are the special object of Satan's attacks. Because he knows that if he can destroy the marriage, he can destroy the home, he can destroy the church, and he can destroy the world. Lord, I pray that you would help every husband and every wife. Strengthen them in spirit to resist the temptations of the devil. That we would seek to have God-honoring marriages. Lord, I... I thank you that when we do that, we get to reap the the joy and the, the blessing of it. While at the same time, we get to bring you honor and glory. It truly is a gift, Lord. And I say thank you for that gift, the gift of marriage. Lord, I pray that we would follow your plan faithfully for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.